Well, we now know the name of the person who is likely to be named as the so-called special master in the criminal investigation of Donald Trump. But we don't yet know what that special master will actually be doing. That is one piece of our breaking news coverage in this hour, which includes new filings in the case th th this evening by federal prosecutors and Donald Trump's lawyers. The other sprawling mass of breaking news that we have tonight is reporting in the New York Times by a team of reporters, including our first guest, under the headline, Justice Department issues 40 subpoenas in a week, expanding its January 6th inquiry. The Times reports Justice Department officials have seized the phones of two top advisors to former President Donald J. Trump and blanketed his aides with about 40 subpoenas in a substantial escalation of the investigation into his efforts to subvert the 2020 election. People familiar with the inquiry said on Monday, the seizure of the phones, coupled with a widening effort to obtain information from those around Mr. Trump after the 2020 election, represent some of the most aggressive steps the department has taken thus far in its criminal investigation into the actions that led to the January 6, 2021 assault on the Capitol by a pro-Trump mob. Federal agents with court-authorized search warrants took phones last week from at least two people, Boris Epstein, an in-house counsel who helps coordinate Mr. Trump's legal efforts, and Mike Roman, a campaign strategist who was the director of Election Day operations for the Trump campaign in 2020, people familiar with the investigation said. The Times reports that Bernard Carrick, the former New York City police commissioner appointed by Rudy Giuliani when Giuliani was mayor, has also received a subpoena. Bernard Carrick helped Rudy Giuliani promote false voter fraud claims, Bernard Carrick's lawyer confirmed to the New York Times that he was subpoenaed by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. Bernard Carrick is the only person in the subpoenaed group of Trump associates who knows what life is like inside federal prison. He is the former New York City police commissioner who was convicted of federal felonies and served time in federal prison. And of course, Donald Trump is the only president of the United States who would seek out and accept help from Bernard Carrick after Carrick got out of prison. The Times reports, according to one subpoena obtained by the New York Times, they asked for any records or communications from people who organized, spoke at, or provided security for Mr. Trump's rally at the Ellipse. Also this evening, the Justice Department filed its response to Donald Trump's list of suggested so-called special masters in the criminal investigation of Donald Trump for illegal possession of government records, including classified records. Donald Trump's lawyers filed their response to the Justice Department's two names proposed as special master. Not surprisingly, the Trump lawyers said they opposed both of the names submitted by the Justice Department. Then the Justice Department replied, saying that one of the two suggested names by the Trump lawyers is acceptable to the Justice Department. That is 78-year-old senior federal judge Raymond Deary, who was appointed to the federal court in 1986 by Republican President Ronald Reagan at the suggestion of New York's then junior senator, Republican Senator Alphonse D'Amato. Judge Deary served a seven-year term on the, on the United States Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, where he became familiar with the handling of classified material. Earlier today, in the case of Donald J. Trump versus the United States of America, Donald Trump's lawyers filed their reply to the Justice Department's filing on Thursday. The Justice Department demanded then that the Trump-appointed judge in the case, Aileen Mercedes Cannon, reverse herself and exclude the 100 classified documents seized from Donald Trump's residence from any examination by the so-called special master. And the Justice Department demanded that the judge reverse herself on her order barring federal prosecutors and the FBI from continuing their investigation of the classified documents. The Justice Department pointed out that it is impossible for the intelligence community to assess the damages to national security in this case without the FBI's continued investigation of what 
has been happening with those documents while in Donald Trump's illegal custody. Today, Donald Trump's lawyers said, in effect, that an FBI affidavit submitted by the Justice Department last week by Alan Kohler Jr., the assistant director of the counterintelligence division of the FBI, is a lie. Kohler's affidavit said the intelligence community's classification review and national security risk assessment are inextricably linked with the criminal investigation. Donald Trump's lawyers said that is simply not true. The FBI is lying about that. And the Trump lawyers, of course, offered no evidence to support their assertion, assertion that the head of counterintelligence at the FBI lied to the judge in this case under oath. We will, in a moment, get Andrew Weissman's expert reading of this pleading, along with Attorney Mark Zaid's interpretation. But for the moment, I'll point out only one stunningly childish passage. On page 15, the Trump lawyers quote the law accurately, saying, quote, the archivist of the United States shall assume responsibility for the custody control and preservation of and access to the presidential records of that president. And then they think they have a winning point in their next line when they say the law, quote, does not say that the archivist must assume custody and control of all materials that fall within the definition of presidential records. So there are the Trump lawyers thinking that they've caught the law writers, thinking that they've found the loophole. The law says shall. It doesn't say must. I am sorry. But I must now invoke what they call in the Senate a point of personal privilege, and that is, as someone who used to write law, I can tell you that shall means must. Those two words mean exactly the same thing in written law. Laws are not written just by the staff members, like I was, who worked for senators or chairman of committees, where the laws really get written. The committee staff writes the first draft of the law, and then we present it to the legislative counsel's office, and that is the place where technical professionals do nothing but write the final words that appear as the law in the United States of America. And they make sure that the legislative intent is clear. They could have written the archivist of the United States may assume responsibility for presidential records. And that would leave the door open to more than one possibility. And laws sometimes do that. That would possibly leave the door open to the dream world that Donald Trump and his lawyers are playing in. And a Trump appointed judge in Florida is pretending to believe. But the legislative council did not leave that door open in this law. The law says that the archivist of the United States shall assume responsibility. And that does indeed close the door tightly and legally on who has the responsibility. When I read this today, I could not believe that there was a legal practitioner out there anywhere in the United States of America who could read the word shall in law and does not know that it means must. Everyone writing laws intends for the word shall to mean must. And Ambassador McFall, as you know, uh, the municipal, uh, municipal council in Moscow, some members there followed up with the same thing we saw from those St. Petersburg officials. St. Petersburg being where, of course, as you know, Vladimir Putin got his political start working in the mayor's office uh, as a bureaucrat and going on from there. Uh, is this the beginning of more of this? It's definitely something new, Lawrence. Uh, I think we're hearing now in public what a lot of Russian elites have been saying privately. They know this war has not been going well. Uh, they're worried about the long-term durability of it. And now with these incredible victories by the Ukrainian warriors on the battlefield, they're now starting to say things in public. Uh, that clip that you just played, and, and yes, thank you, Julia Davis, for watching so much Russian TV so that the rest of us don't have to, although I did watch that clip because I know Boris Nadezhdin, the guy you just showed, and it is remarkable that he would be allowed even to say that. 
on Russian television. Remember, that station is controlled by the Kremlin. It shows that there is a lot of finger pointing going on now, not by Nadezhda towards Putin just yet, but towards the generals, intelligence officers. That suggests there's disarray and confusion about where this war goes next. Is there is there a kind of American uh, Vietnam scenario here where uh, in 1968, uh, President Lyndon Johnson was basically driven from office by the failures uh, of the American approach to the Vietnam War. Uh, and that eventually, through the Nixon, following Nixon administration, making some of the same mistakes, but constantly trying to get out, uh, they eventually got out. Uh, and so that's how the North Vietnamese won. They, they wore down uh, the American resolve uh, inside the government. Is, is a scenario like that possible here, where the Ukrainian forces continue to succeed so thoroughly militarily that they wear down uh, the internal support structure within Russia, which includes the support structure for Putin himself? Yes. But with one big difference, uh, Russia today is a dictatorship, not a democracy, and therefore it'll take a lot longer for that to happen. So the analogy I use is not Vietnam, but actually Brezhnev's invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, that's when he overreached. That's when he went too far. And they were bogged down there for a long, long time. But the unraveling of the regime took a lot longer. It didn't happen overnight. They were there for a decade. And eventually it led to Gorbachev the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, but it was a long, long process. And a as you look at it tonight, with, with people using the word victory now and Applebaum in, in the Atlantic, and a very well-concerted piece uh, concludes, we must expect that a Ukrainian victory, and certainly a victory in Ukraine's understanding of the term, also brings about the end of Putin's regime. Are these premature hopes and dreams? Well, like Brezhnev in Afghanistan, uh, that was the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union, but it didn't happen when Brezhnev was in power. Uh, and, you know, political scientists like myself, we're not good at predicting the future. By the way, neither are intelligence agencies. But I, I do think this is the beginning of the end of Putinism as a regime. I just don't want to go out on a limb and predict when that will actually happen. No, I, I have found myself very reluctant to use the word victory in anything that I'm saying about yes, this. But exactly. I, am, I am really struck by, by uh, what a big swell uh, uh, of that word is occurring in the last couple of days among thoughtful observers. Well, and among my Ukrainian friends, Lawrence, I mean, I talk to Ukrainian government officials pretty much every day. They're cautious. They don't want to get ahead of their skis. They're worried about counteroffensives. And remember, they haven't liberated Donbass or Crimea, uh, which President Zelensky has set as goals. But they are more optimistic today than they've been since they won the Battle of Kiev several months ago. I don't understand the connection between opinions that people disagree with and the legitimacy of the court. Don't understand the connection. The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Roberts, said that on Friday at a time when the country is watching a Trump-appointed judge at the lowest level of the federal court system trying to give Donald Trump everything he wants by interfering with a federal criminal investigation of Donald Trump. And John Roberts said that at a time when 10-year-old girls in America who are rape victims are being ordered by the laws of their states to give birth because they were raped and those laws were authorized by the United States Supreme Court. John Roberts did that himself. John Roberts himself joined the Supreme Court opinion that was the first in history to take rights away from women and girls and insist that suddenly 10-year-old girls in this country, by law, must give birth after being raped. And John Roberts wonders why people don't simply stop at politely disagreeing with that opinion and take that next step to question the very legitimacy of the court. The court quoted the 400-year-old opinions of British judges who believed in putting witches to death and did indeed themselves sentence witches to death. They quoted those British judges in opposition to abortion to justify their own decision 
in 2022 to force 10-year-old girls in this country to give birth after being raped. The court's legitimacy is being questioned by members of the Supreme Court itself. Justice, Justices Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor wrote in their dissent that John Roberts' Supreme Court majority overturning Roe versus Wade, quote, undermines the court's legitimacy. Joining us now are Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor and legal correspondent for Slate and host of the podcast Amicus. She is the author of the upcoming book, Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Also with us, Claire McCaskill, former Democratic senator of Missouri. They are both MSNBC analysts. Uh, and Senator McCaskill, uh, John Roberts just doesn't get it. He just doesn't get the connection uh, between disagreeing with appointments, opinions of the court, and then questioning the legitimacy. Now, this is a guy who's really out of touch. I mean, let me count the ways the legitimacy can be questioned. First, people were put on the court with a political two-by-four wielded by Mitch McConnell. First, by denying a sitting president an opportunity to name a Supreme Court justice, first time in history. Second, by installing a, a judge moments before a presidential election, never before in history. Third, he's got a guy sitting on the Supreme Court whose wife is helping plot the overthrow of the government. And then they overturn a right that women had in this country for 50 years. It is unbelievable how bad it is. And Dahlia Luthwick, uh, one of your solutions that you propose in your brilliant new piece in Slate is expand the courts, uh, not just the Supreme Court, which is legislatively possible but difficult, but the lower courts, including the district courts, like, for example, the district courts in Florida, where Donald Trump right now has one of his very own judges doing everything she possibly can for him. Uh, one of the ironies of the special prosecutor uh, choice, a special master choice in this case, Raymond Deary, is that in 1986, Ronald Reagan was able to appoint him to a federal judgeship that did not exist the year before, because it was created in an expansion, exactly the kind of expansion you're talking about uh, in the district courts. That's exactly right, Lawrence. And, and the courts have been expanded historically over time, not just the district courts, by the way, and the circuit courts, but the Supreme Court. The number there has not been static either. And in fact, you know, the Judicial Conference, which has been nonpartisan body that develops uh, policy for the courts, is begging for expansion of the lower federal courts because of the backlog. Because unless you're Donald Trump, you can wait for years uh, to be heard in court. And so there are a whole bunch of measures, whether it's jurisdiction stripping, whether it is adding seats to the bench, whether it is protecting voting rights from judicial intervention. There's a lot of things that can be done. And I think that the days of wringing our hands and saying we have to live under the thumb of Trump judges for all eternity, because nothing can be done. Those days have to kind of end now. Now there's a whole bunch of things that can be done, and we have to stop talking about them as abstractions. Uh, Claire McCaskill, if the Democrats add two senators uh, to their count, get up to 52 senators in the Senate, will they be able to expand the courts? I don't think so. I, I do not believe that there will be enough votes to do that. But I do think there's an opportunity to talk about a lot of ethics reform, term limits, and maybe age limits, since uh, the idea of a lifelong appointment, I think, has uh, really gone out of fashion, especially uh, for this Supreme Court. 